The EU has described the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction as potentially the greatest threat uh, to its security. And although it had been involved in non-proliferation work uh, for some years, uh, an EU strategy to combat uh, WMD proliferation by both states and non-state actors kind of came into being over the course of 2003. And these threats have been brought into sharp focus by both the 9-11 attacks and also by the transatlantic divisions leading up to uh, the Iraq war. Uh, the WMD strategy argued that the spread of such weapons made it more likely that they would end up being used eventually, and also that their development posed a direct threat to Europe and also indirectly to European uh, regional interests. And it also warned the possession of, of WMD by non-state actors could allow a small group to inflict a level of damage to European cities that previously had only been within the, the reach of uh, large national armies. Uh, the strategy and its kind of accompanying policy papers are kind of too detailed to go into, into exhaustive detail here, but one of the most important components was what was termed effective multilateralism, which they described as the cornerstone of the WMD strategy. And in some ways this was seen as a, as a response to what had been perceived as the kind of overly unilateral approach of the Bush administration, but the EU was not turning away from the Americans and emphasized the need for close partnership with its, its international um, allies to strengthen the non-proliferation regime. And the EU has attempted to universalize and strengthen the various treaties and verification uh, and export control regimes that make up the global non-proliferation regime. And more recently, it's contributed money and expertise to improving CBRN security standards, both across the EU and also um, abroad. The strategy also called for the strengthening of the EU structures that deal with, with proliferation. This has had kind of mixed success. And promoting uh, stable regional environments in an attempt to target the demand side of proliferation. But it did recognize that if preventative measures failed, then coercion certainly had its place in, in non-proliferation, even including the use of force. But it stressed that the Security Council, the UN Security Council, would be the uh, final arbiter in this scenario. Instead, the EU has tried to harness its economic power as a non-proliferation tool, and has tried to use it as an inducement by inserting so-called WMD clauses into agreements with external states that, in theory, could condition economic cooperation on good uh, proliferation behavior. But again, this has had somewhat mixed uh, success, uh, with some countries, notably India, refusing to include uh, such a clause in the agreement. And there are a few provisions to decide whether a state has violated its obligations, and if it has, how to, how to trigger the clause. Another way in which the EU has tried to use its economic power is in the case of Iran, which is really the kind of main test case of the EU's proliferation policy so far. European states were very eager for Iran to be the kind of first example of effective multilateralism in, in practice. And the chapter describes in some detail the various threats, direct and indirect, that Iran's pursuit of nuclear weapon capability poses to Europe, and the strategy that Britain, France, and, and Germany and helped by the EU itself, have used to dissuade Iran from its activities. <clears throat> in essence, um, the Europeans had some success in the earlier years of negotiations in which Iran suspended its enrichment activities and, and signed up to the additional protocol. But since 2005, it's remained intransigent. And the incentives offered to Iran as topics of negotiation if it suspended its enrichment and reprocessing activities have been uh, rejected. Iran has also ignored the five uh, UN Security Council resolutions, uh, four of which mandated sanctions. Now, the EU has not only implemented the, the UN sanctions, but it's also taken them further and applied more stringent measures, especially since, since last summer, and it's to be commended for doing so, for reaching consensus on these, these, um, these actions, since many of its member states have significant economic ties to Iran and have much more to lose from actually uh, putting these uh, measures into practice. Um, Lady Ashton, uh, the High Representative, is the main interlocutor in the E3 plus 3 negotiations with Iran, but unfortunately, as, as we've seen, these haven't been going very far recently, and there's been, the Iranians have adopted a somewhat um, passive-aggressive uh, attitude in them, uh, and as far as I know, no date has been set for the next round of talks. So just to wrap up, um, the EU can play a vital role in bolstering the international non-proliferation regime by strengthening and universalizing its treaties, conventions, and the other component parts of the international architecture. In practical terms, it can also make a very powerful contribution through the promotion of best practices, both within the EU and, and abroad with third countries. The promotion of strong measures in nuclear, radiological, chemical, and biological security will be particularly important in the context of a global expansion in nuclear power, growing industrial sectors in the developing world, 
and the spread of biotechnology. And the effect of, of 27 European states acting in concert contributes to a normative trend in, in favour of the non-proliferation regime. So in this sense, the EU can have a useful role as a kind of global non good, good non-proliferation citizen. Exacting a price on Iran for its continuing non-compliance is another way of strengthening the international non-proliferation regime. And since last year, the EU has been much more willing to act in unison to, to do this. It remains to be seen whether it's now too late for these measures to be effective enough to dissuade Iran from its current course. And we should hope that they do, because Iran's acquisition of a nuclear weapon capability, despite the best part of a decade of European diplomacy, would represent a failure of the WMD strategy and undermine the EU's uh, claim to be an effective actor on the world stage.